Doug, congrats on your new show on Sci-Fi. Thank you so much. I can't be more excited. Well, it just launched in February, mm -hmm. and one the first three episodes are available on Sci-Fi on the app. They're available for free viewing on the app. And if you have a cable provider or something like that, or you join, you can see a couple the following two after that. Oh, that's fantastic. And then also, you can still watch them live. That's still a thing, right? Yeah, such a thing as cable TV. It's crazy. <laughs> well, they're going to be actually, the reason we're airing this interview today is that tomorrow night at midnight, Saturday at midnight, so technically Sunday, they're going to air the first four in a row on the Sci-Fi yes. channel. For anyone that missed it or anyone that missed maybe one of them, it's Saturday at midnight, which means Sunday morning, which everyone gets confused by, but Saturday night. Saturday night. Well, this is great because they're short. They're like 11 minutes each. So it's great to bunch them up together. Yeah, they're so short. There's no reason not to watch. Yeah, right? <laughs> they're their morsels. They're like snacks. Yeah, yeah, very filling, but very short. That you've had, a, you've had a really interesting career. I mean, like, wait until people hear this. I mean, this is going to sell the show right here. Now, you were a founding member of Wizard Entertainment. Yes, that's really dating myself. But in the early 90s, when Wizard started, I was working out of Garib Seamus's, the publisher's bedroom, which he converted into like a work office. And I was working on the very first issue that ever came out. Well, this and was, this was pre-internet. So this was like the premier comic book news source at yes. the time. It before was a publication. The internet, before the internet put all the magazines out of business. <laughs> We were where you went for all your comic book info and fun stuff. Yeah, you had conventions. Wizard was a very big name. Yeah, we, you know, we got complaints from the comic book publishers that people would read us instead of buying comics. And we were like, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, we're so good at our job. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the best things about Wizard, at least to fans like me, was that you had Twisted Toy Fair Theater. Yes. I remember being little and I would get Wizard, uh, uh, the Wizard magazine, and I would flip immediately always to that section. Yep. It was we just so were, fantastic. We were very silly. We would put word balloons on like all of our pictures everywhere just to be silly. And then one day we we're like, let's let's make an adventure. And we would we would photograph the toys with different backgrounds doing their own little comic book adventure with their own little word balloons. That was that was comedy. It was hilarious. And people loved it. Yeah. Which, which thank God, because then we, we stayed employed. Well, yes, because you spun that off into Robot Chicken, which you also helped start. Yes. Well, what happened is Matthew Senrich was the editor of our toy magazine at the time. We all kind of changed positions at Wizard from time to time. He heard that Seth Green liked action figures, called for an interview. Seth knew the magazine and loved it. We all became friends. So Seth was like, we're gonna, we're gonna pitch something like stop motion as a show. And that's, that's kind of where it all came from. And you know, when, whenever people ask for advice on how to start a show, I'm like, well, you gotta first be friends with Seth Green. And then, then <laughs> well, that's not totally it. true. We're gonna talk in a moment how you got this one because he's not involved <laughs> in all of this, but that's yeah. fantastic. I mean, way to hustle. I mean, really, oh, you guys oh. were very smart to do that. And so you worked on Robot Chicken. You were not only a founder, but you, you, know, you were a creator, creative person on that show, one of the main people. Also, side note, you're also a writer on Star Wars Detours. So you're being funny everywhere. That, that was awesome. I got to work up at um, Skywalker Ranch with George Lucas himself. I, I, I'm not quite sure that show is ever going to see the light of day. Um, <laughs> he feels you making fun of all of his stuff. Did he, can he laugh at himself? Because sometimes it seems yeah. like not he he has a very he's like a grandpa at this point and his sense of humor is is a very nice on a grandpa level like there are some times where i'd pitch a joke and i'd look at him and he's laughing his ass off and then no one else in the room is laughing and i'm like i don't know if this is good or bad <laughs> so but it was it was laughing awesome. yeah so good that's and for fantastic. anyone that's curious skywalker ranch in the cafeteria has the best apple juice i've had in my entire life Oh, is it so, there, like they make it themselves or they just yeah. like it's no joke they make it themselves they sell like turkey sandwiches and they have turkeys wild on the property so i don't know if they murder those turkeys for the sandwiches <laughs> that's but crazy it's all, it's all very they're legit making their own 
turkey. They're going to try to put you sleep over there with, with Maybe. delicious apple juice and turkey sandwiches. <laughs> Can't complain. There are wild turkeys on Skywalker Ranch. You know, at least we saw them. Maybe not. They're, maybe they're not official Skywalker turkeys. Maybe they have a turkey, turkey problem, and that's why they're serving turkey sandwiches. Yeah. There's a turkey wrangler with a shotgun walking around, just making sure they don't bother anybody. That's hilarious, especially that George. So you can talk to anyone. You can bother anyone, George. No. So now you have your own TV show. I mean, that's just fantastic. Devil May Care. Yes. So how do you get your own TV show? I mean, obviously your resume helps, but still, yeah, yeah. you know, Hollywood's a tough town. Well, luckily, um, people like Robot Chicken. And because of that, when my agent is asked if he knows anybody that is like clever and funny and interesting that producers may want to work with, they think of me and I get sent on a lot of meet and greets. And I started working with this company called PSYOP, which did commercials. And I, I helped write the Ghostbusters commercial that appeared in the NBA with Kobe Bryant a few years back. Oh, wow. Not my, fault, not my fault that the new Ghostbusters movie was not all that. I just did the commercial. And one day they were like, you know, we're going to start making our own shows. Do you have any ideas? And I said, do I have any ideas? Let me tell you. And the basic idea that became Devil May Care was one of them. And they liked it. And the rest was so history. again, Hollywood is a town of relationships. Totally. I always tell people Hollywood is just like dating. You have to talk to a lot of people. Maybe that seems like they like you. Maybe they don't. You never know for sure. Everyone's keeping yeah. their options open. Yep. They might be stringing <laughs> you along. You never know. It, <laughs> That's it's a great metaphor for Hollywood. Totally. And, and meet and greets are like blind dates. Exactly. So if you're, if you're out there playing the game, luckily, eventually something might connect the same way where someday you might find the one to marry. That's fair. That's a great way to look at it. A lot of yeah. broken hearts in Hollywood, but you just got to get back on the horse. Uh, you know, a lot of people just end up broken and alone. So it works. Like dating. <laughs> yeah, it works both ways. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I've watched some of these episodes. Sci-Fi sent them my way. They're very funny. Thank you. So as someone who has made their career coming up with so many jokes, I mean, and the level of jokes, you have jokes upon jokes upon jokes, which is something that Robot Chicken was really famous for. Like when your main character first shows up at hell, you have um, uh, like uh, Helcom as the yeah. button on the greeters thing. And that's just so clever. It made me laugh. And it was just, you know, I'm sure a lot of people even miss that joke. Well, you know, what's funny is I, I, I'm sure everyone does this. I do this. When I watch TV, I also have my phone and I'm doing something on my phone while I'm watching TV. Like it's not just short attention span, it's like negative attention span. Yeah. Where you're, you're desperately trying to fill like your mind. So I thought if people are gonna watch this show, I gotta, I gotta throw everything but the kitchen sink into it. I've gotta have jokes in the background. I have to have like the dialogue always has to be interesting. There has to be always something going on. So I got really neurotic about it. So hopefully- oh, I think you did it. I, I, I had me, my attention. Thanks. I mean, what? hopefully you can pause it and just like study the little jokes in the background all the time, I hope. Well, what's your writing process like for jokes, right? I mean, I think a lot of people will be interested in this. I mean, I'm sure it's a combination of like some that you save, some that you just come up with on the spot, but you know, what's it like to have to be funny like all the time? I mean, you, even for just 11 minutes. Well, I always keep a file like on my computer that's called random thoughts. And if I ever have a thought that I think is funny, I type it right in there. Oh, that's great. And some of them, when I reread months later, makes no sense. But you know, there are some good ones that are still in there. But when I write the script, I write far more than can fit. Because I, I, I try not to censor myself. I'm just like, I'm just writing whatever I think. And then I have people I trust read it over and point out where they think it's not funny, maybe suggest that's some more really jokes. Smart. It just keeps getting added to and added to. And then the network tells me what they think. My producers tell me what they think. And then we animate more than we can air. So we have to cut things out of animation. But by the time it gets to the, to the air, we have cut out everything that possibly wasn't the funniest. And That's why it's so stuff. potent. Yes. That's yeah. fascinating. That's really smart. It's the same thing as, as Robot Chicken. I kind of picked, stole it from there. Where on Robot Chicken, we write... And we go to animatic with far more than we could possibly use. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
Right, exactly. Let me ask you this. A lot of people today want to do improv when they do their comedy projects. Okay. You know, they're like, oh, we'll just make with a bunch of funny people. The magic will just happen when we're filming. What do you think of that versus, you know, having the jokes written? I think you always have to have a show. You have to go into it knowing there's a show there. You, you have to write stuff to start. And if you have creative, funny people, they can build on that and make it funnier. But, you know, you've got to go to step one with something you can use, in my opinion. You can't just trust like, oh, it'll come together later because, you know, maybe, maybe. It rarely it does, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like people playing blackjack thinking they'll win eventually. It's quite possible that you'll run out of money before you win. You can't just say you'll win someday. Yeah, even if you're very talented, you know, it's, I think that I, I, I'm a strong believer in the script. And I think you're a great example of that because your stuff is so funny. Thank you. Uh, now, I think it's really a funny idea, speaking of funny, that, hey, all the cool stuff would go to hell. So hell would actually probably be a pretty fun place. Well, I was always thinking the idea that if you follow all of God's rules means you go to heaven and everyone else goes to hell. There seems like there's more to that. You know, because what, what are those rules all about? Like, why? Why? So I was thinking, what if, what if we're misinterpreting something? What if God simply wants to spend eternity with everything that's awesome and everything that's less than awesome in any way just goes to the trash bin called hell? Like he doesn't want to deal with any of that. Like if it's like if someone is the most amazing human being ever, but they snore, they go to hell. Like what? Like why would God put up with that? That's fantastic. So, what happens when you have the health full of everybody and every product and every idea that just didn't pass that muster? It's That's fantastic. Great. And you have some great sight gags too about like some of the sponsors of hell, you know, like who would be down there. I thought that was yeah. great. I have to say one of the, you have a lot of funny characters on the show, but one of the most interesting out of left field is president McKinley <laughs> is the devil's number two. Now, sadly, there are a lot of presidents you could have chosen. So I'm interested why you went with McKinley, besides the great joke about American history classes. <laughs> well, because I, well, first of all, I love the fact that after the first couple of presidents, like, you know, Jefferson and Washington, there's like a big crowd of just old white guys that wear black coats. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> there's like, and no one knows who they are. There's Abraham Lincoln in the middle somewhere, but then it just keeps going until you hit like a Roosevelt or something. Yeah. Who, I think who most people, people Carter. <laughs> Nixon, I guess. Nixon, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe some go all the way to like Bush, but I don't know. So I thought it would be great to have a right hand man who was used to being old school in charge, but now he's someone's assistant level guy. What better than one of those old school black coat wearing presidents? And then I was like, who is it going to be? I don't know any of these people myself. <laughs> so I went to Wikipedia, just started looking at them. And McKinley on his website on Wikipedia has like this photograph, old school photograph of the most intense resting face where I was like, wah, when I saw it. <laughs> and I'm like, that's him. That's my guy. He's so intense. You've captured that in the animation. Yeah. And you know what? The, the fact that he was the president during the Spanish-American War just gave me so much to work with. There are so many little side comments from him saying, oh, Spain and stuff like that here and there. It's, he's perfect. It's perfect. Also, I have to ask, do you have a cat? Because have, cats are have, really important to the show. Yes, I have two cats right now uh, at different points in my life with different roommates. There was one point where I think we had nine cats at once, which was not by choice. That was a long story, but it sounds like a lot of fun at first, but it is not. It is not. It sounds a lot like what you wrote here, to be honest. Yeah, I, it's, it's a true fact that cats are evil. Um, I'm not, you know, spoiler alert for life. Cats seem cute, but they are only cute because they want you to think they're cute. They're very evil creatures. <laughs> That's crazy that you had nine cats. Wow. That's Who knew it would come back story. and be such a gift later for this show? It, yes, thank God. Thank, but I guess it worked out after all. Well, also a, a running gag is that, you know, a lot of the stuff in hell is very modern, but you really have like an office, uh, you know, like, uh, 
framework that's put over the show. And office humor has been around and very popular for a while from office space to the office. And even the recent Harley Quinn show on HBO Max, you know, treats the Legion of Doom like it was run by an office. And Alan Tudyk, by the way, who voices their Joker is your devil. Yeah, he so gets around. What, what, he's fantastic. What would you tell uh, viewers is the difference with your show that makes it really stand out from those other ones? The difference, well, here's, here's the tagline, which doesn't, which is what we use. Who can run this office but the boss from hell? Uh, and that's, that's devil. He's in hell. So, but the reason why it's, it's different is because of devil's mentality. He doesn't know that all this is God's garbage. He just thinks he was given a promotion to run a second dimension after hell, and he's doing the best job he can. So all of his ideas are kind of fit the weirdness of hell. He's out of the box thinking. He thinks everything is cool when it's not. He's, he's kind of, imagine the guy at Microsoft that was in charge of designing the Zoom. He thinks he's doing an awesome job. He has no idea that when it launches, everyone's going to make fun of it. You know, so, so what if that guy got to run hell? That's fantastic. So also speaking of like all these animated shows for adults, it's exploding. Adult animation is more popular than it's ever been. It seems yeah. that Hollywood finally has recognized that it should go mainstream. And this is just the beginning. There are tons of adult animation shows coming down the pipeline. So as someone who has worked and actually helped create this, thanks to your work with uh, Twisted Toy Fair Theater and Robot Chicken, what's it like to see it suddenly become like really mainstream and Hollywood embrace it like this? I love it, but for better or for worse, I think the reason why it's exploding right now is because in the quarantine, you can still make animation. That's Live scary. action, not so much. You can't have a crowd of actors together because you know they, they can get sick. But animation, we did this whole show from all of our homes. Like, this whole show was made during quarantine? Yeah, the whole thing. And, and That's an amazing turnaround, turnaround, by the way. Thank you. But, well, the network wanted it ASAP, so we're like, whatever you say. The, the production company, Titmouse in Canada, everybody basically took their computers home and worked at home. So the Zoom meetings were really funny because I'm seeing everybody's living rooms and bedrooms and stuff. And it's almost like we're just doing this for fun because there's nothing formal at all. That's so great. The question is, once the quarantine is lifted and people can do live action again, will all this great animation stick around? And I hope it will. I hope it's not just this fad because networks need programming. I think it will. I think they'll see how popular it is. And also, you know, forget just the thing about, you know, you can have a crowd during a pandemic, but I mean, you can do like stuff like you couldn't, I think how expensive your show would be to make in yeah. live action. It's impossible. And yeah. I mean, the best Star Wars shows are all animated nowadays that, that everyone loves the new Star Trek, Lower Decks animated show and there's another one coming. I think animation is being very much accepted where it seemed like a kid thing years ago. Now everyone knows it's just part of the show. It's great. Thank goodness, because it's yeah. great. Now, I have to also say your cast is really amazing, right? So you have fan favorites like Alan Tudyk, which we just mentioned, Stephanie Beatrice, uh, Phil Lamar, famous uh -huh. voice, voice actress Pamela Adlon. And then I was delighted to see that your, uh, that the devil's assistant is played by Norm from WandaVision. <laughs> yes. Did you know all the WandaVision spoilers in advance? He refused to tell me. No! I, I respected that. I'm like, I don't want to get you in trouble. But I'm, and he's like, I, I don't know what I can tell you. I'm like, well, don't, if you told me a certain character is wearing a certain kind of shoes, I might be able to interpret something from that. So tell me nothing. Like, I'm such a Marvel fan. I grew up reading Marvel comics. All these movies are great. Like, I'm sure I would be able to tell anything that happens based on his little, like, oh, this guy had blue fingertips or something. He's like, ah! Yeah. But he's not only been in WandaVision, he had a role in an episode of The Mandalorian. Like, if you check his IMDb page, he's had a lot of nerd stuff to do. And he's, he's awesome. He's so much fun. That's so cool. Well, you're helping him build the building blocks of his career. So this, yeah. he's, he's great here, too. So and how did you put together this cast? How'd you get all these cool people? It's all casting director. Uh, Linda... Her last name, La Montage. Oh, she's going to be so mad at me. I'm sure I got her last name wrong. Um, she's a casting director, and we would sit down and really talk about who the character is, like, and what I want them to do in the show. She would suggest names. We'd go back and forth, and we would just 
watch videos with our eyes closed, like listening to their voices. Like Asif, the guy from Long Division, I hadn't heard of him before. He's mainly a stand-up comedian. I watched a video of his stand-up and I'm like, oh my God, that, that voice is perfect. He's perfect. And when she mentioned maybe Pamela Adlon for Regina, the, the devil's wife. I love Regina. Yeah, two seconds after she said the name, I was like, that's perfect. Is she available? Like that, that'd be so amazing. She's, she's the perfect. So, and it was just luck that she knew that Alan was probably available to hear pitches because he's so busy. Um, and he's a big dude to, to get him. He, he liked it. And I'm like, like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. And he really brought the character to life. Like I had something in my head and he was on the page. But once he started speaking, I'm like, oh my God, now he's now he exists. That's for real. It was so great. That's so cool. Well, congratulations. Uh, so it's one season right now? One season right now. Um, so hopefully if more and more people watch it and we are in that position of like being really like, soup, let's try to be friends in Seinfeld. We'll see what we do. And when the season has run its course, sci-fi will sit and say, well, what do we do now? And well, hopefully- Hopefully we go so everybody go try it. So you, yes. know, you can check it out on NBC.com. And then also tomorrow again, or Saturday at midnight, if you're watching this on Saturday, Saturday at midnight, they're going to have a marathon of the first four episodes. And I'm sure it'll eventually head to Peacock and, um, and to the, uh, to Apple oh. and all those places. Uh, yeah. You're, and you know, I know you make a lot of fun of social media on the show, yeah. uh, but you are, you have a Twitter account, right? I do. It's mostly to argue about politics, but I do. So that's good, though. But people can follow you and you can keep them updated on when the next episode will air because you have seven in total. And exactly. then also what's going on at the show. Yes. So please follow. It's Doug underscore gold. Oh, that's awesome. Well, congratulations again. It's a very funny show. Thank you so much.